Hello, David. Good to, Hello, good to see you. It's been really nice to talk with you about world building, about narrative storytelling and creating positive visions of the future in which AI mm -hmm. uh, didn't go rogue, <laughs> but became <laughs> somewhat gracious and you have a very unique mm -hmm. um, perspective on it and some very cool experiences with it. So I'm excited to explore that uh, with you today. Um, maybe yeah, before thank we you for, start. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, it's been it's been really nice to get to know you mm. and talk about this. So um, maybe you want to share a little bit about uh, your work in the in this field and where you are currently uh, at, where you're located. I know you're uh, from the states, but currently residing in Europe. What have you been up to? Mm -hmm. Well. Um... I, I came to uh, this brave new world of thinking about the involving transformation of narrative um, about 20 years ago, as I began to sort of exit the theater um, and begin to discover that there were much more profound ways to connect to people and build the creativity of the audience and potentially the creative, the new way of thinking for people in the artistic community. Um, so my journey took a road through uh, transmedia narrative. It took a road through game design. It took a road through immersive performance and into creative technologies as they have emerged over the last 20 years. Um, and with the, uh, uh, um, I'll say the emergence of uh, artificial intelligence, which I actually prefer your term, natural intelligence, um, that it has become very exciting to see things that I have done in the previously non-AI infused landscape generate a speed, which is not just, it's not about saving time, it's about creating new possibilities of people being able to explore um, their imaginations and to share their imaginations at a pace and scale which transforms the experience completely. So we can move from personal, uh, the development of personal mythology to uh, a culture of people working together in a shared mythology to developing cultures, ultimately to develop world building, and then to use AI to visualize it to be able to enter into it in 360 through a headset so people can actually connect not only with each other more um, vivaciously, but also with their imaginations and with their non-visible selves. Because I think we are stuck as humans currently with how we look, um, age, uh, gender, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, um, so many factors where we not only prejudge, but anticipate behavior. Once one has moved into the creative self, you know, we are just souls, we're just beings, we're creative entities with imaginations and with um, uh, a flow that makes us part of something, again, quoting you, something more amorphous and therefore much more beautiful to share in and ultimately more human than it is uh, artificial right yeah yeah that's really where the amorphousine vision was built around mm -hmm. right that we mm -hmm. exactly as you say no longer identify with these narratives that exist within our head with our identities in this world what we do where we come from how old we are right. etc but with mm -hmm. our inner inner amorphous core and right. how cool that ai now gives us this opportunity to create digital basically formless amorphous worlds in which we are without any um friction navigating what it means to be human connect with each other play with each other and then translate these lessons that how I, that's how i see it back to the real world and that's also really cool about 
you know, world building and imagination. It's really about learning something new, experiencing something that changes you permanently so that you can then reapply it in your life, um, mm -hmm. in protecting the planet, in being exceptionally good at your job. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's a very positive way of seeing that. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the value? Why do you think this value is now especially important or this, the, 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 um, the art of world building is especially important in the age of AI? Hmm. Um, I think, I mean, I had a very interesting experience uh, a couple of months ago. I have been given, a, I'm teaching at uh, FH Salzburg, part of the University of Applied Sciences in the School of Creative Technology. I'm on a sabbatical from my university, uh, SUNY Purchase in New York. Um, and they wanted me to teach a course in world building. And it was interesting because that world building is inside of everything that I do in theater, in transmedia, in immersive storytelling, in game design, which I also teach. But I'd never taught it as a subject, as a standalone. So I began to think, why, is, why are we world building? <laughs> we have a world, right? I mean, this is the, the very young uh, David Basick was never wanting to read fiction because it wasn't true. I only wanted to read biographies and histories. Um, and then I discovered, you know, the great writings of the lost generation as a child. And I was suddenly, I understood that there's a difference between photography and painting, right? And so in the world of world building, one is actually painting and finding things that you don't see in the documentary evidence. So the distinction between fiction and nonfiction and the distinction between our world and world building began to suddenly click for me. It was like an old impulse, like a 12 year old impulse sending it to me today. And I thought, well, what are the reasons that we world build? So essentially we're creating a parallel world for us to research the real world. We're creating a parallel world for us to um, understand ourselves without all of the containers and boundaries of our actual existence, we can live in the imaginary, which is in some sense more true than the everyday life. So we're able to look at this handshake between the imagination and the facts, which you need both. But in fact, the world is a tremendous source for world building. We're not world building with the mind of a, of a Martian, we're <laughs> world building with the mind of humans. So in that sense, moving into uh, designing parallel worlds of all kinds um, is the act of uh, taking the promise of a world we don't quite understand and giving ourselves the tools to fashion it, right, in our imagination. And when AI emerges, now we have a tool that enables us to actually uh, push our imaginations not only out personally, but to share in the imaginations of other humans who have been positing and questioning similar things. So world building becomes a practice to develop parallel worldism, which enables us to both uh, discover our own imaginations, but also generate communities, um, which in the analog, uh, in, the, in the world pre-AI, existed only through you know fandom and you know uh, within cultures of you know novels like dune or star wars like those worlds but now we have the capacity to generate original uh worlds we can generate an original world building of a group of five people and if those five people are students together they're suddenly a team creative and collectively um if they're people who work together in a business they're people who are able to reimagine not only themselves as co-workers, but also perhaps even their company in a future sense, in a parallel sense. So that, that root of why world building is essential to our humanity. Um, and in this era, we have the capacity to do things with 
that human element that can take us far beyond anything we might have been able to do in previous generations. Right. And, and with that, also invite others who, I mean, mm -hmm. just, just stating the facts that there are still so many people that I encounter who have this basic fear around the future with AI, right? Mm -hmm. And because we have been world building this fear very sophisticated mm -hmm. <laughs> into our imagination, because our popular imagination is crowded with science fiction films, that portray Terminator or other yeah. types of ex, ex machina is another example of these AIs that eventually will turn against us and um, mm -hmm. control us or find very um, efficient and intelligent ways to get rid of us, um, <laughs> which is a very valid uh, point of view if we don't change as humans, let that be clear. Like I. I see we have a massive transformation to make to to come from where we currently are to where we want to go because our perception in the Western world has been that we are separated from nature, that we are separated from each other. We have been mm -hmm. locked up in these identities and not very fluidly being able to communicate with each other and share perspectives and show empathy for different mm -hmm. perspectives. What that means for AI is because it's a mirror of us and our intelligence, it will start to mirror that. So if we uh, mm -hmm. uh, live from a perception of we have to control each other, our bodies, nature, we will mm -hmm. create AI that will have to do the same. It starts to control us in ways mm -hmm. beyond our wildest imagination. Or, well, people have made an effort to conceptualize that. But what right. we haven't seen, and what's so important, is these positive futures or protopias, where, which is a term coined by Ke Kevin Kelly, which is a prototypable future, one step better than we currently have. It's still your wildest imagination, but it mm -hmm. also is a little bit more rooted in realism. And Monica Bielskiet is also someone who has really popularized mm -hmm. that term. And I like it because it gives us the opportunity to together imagine futures with AI that are not that ro rogue future, but that are uh, a, a, a positive step in the right direction. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's obviously the third category, which is utopia, which is really about, you know, how, how could we how would we want to live if everything is in harmony with each other or if everything is right feels right to us but the thing with that is that many people have designed their utopia and we have seen them as artists and we have placed ourselves in their worlds but they could not resonate with us or only with a small percentage of people and now in this era we have the opportunity to imagine and visualize our own utopias and invite each other into these worlds so that we can you know become more holistic in the sense of experiencing many different parallel realities which actually mm -hmm. creates almost a quantum um experience of of reality which is how mm -hmm. i believe reality really works the nature of reality mm -hmm. really works um and 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 you know by placing others in our futures we can maybe take away some fear for the future maybe we can invite them to also imagine what their future could look like and we can start to tell more positive stories about the future and create a more mm -hmm. um a hopeful audience um right. yeah and this could translate so, into film and i mean we could we could you can soon yeah. make your own films from your own rules and invite people to watch them without having to have multi-million dollar pr productions right um right so, so we're already be we're already beginning to have that with people being able to make films on their phones so we've actually entered that year and now we they could use it with sora and what evolves from sora so we could move right from we could begin to, you know, uh, do. I did a project. Let's let's um, quickly state what Sora is for the people who don't know. Oh, oh, Sora is an evolution of 
open AI that uh, is yet to be launched publicly, but is uh, enables prompting to deliver video and uh, action. Um, and you know how far it goes and where it goes, but it's already many years ahead of where people thought it would be now. Um, I think I want to go back to a, a thought, like the root of it. Like, so um, how do we find a more useful, proactive protopia, the future we would like or prefer to have, right? Um, and I think it, before you get to there, you have to uh, develop a conversation with the creatives or the humans that are doing this as to you know, what is the world you'd prefer to live in? Um, do you want to live in a world of uh, vengeance or do you want to live in a world of forgiveness and evolution positively? I mean, I think that the human, un the unresolved human questions of how are we, who are we, and how do we get on with each other um, need to be central to the development and use of um, stories, which is like the original uh, powerhouse, and then into the evolution of storytelling with AI, which just takes the power of story and gives it the ability to move at a speed, like at the speed of light. So we can go from impulses to visualizations, from visualizations to um, visualized behaviors, where there's less of a lag between, I think it, I see it. Um, but before we get to the thinking, we actually have to um, like install, um, uh, install a kind of process where people actually become reflective, um, uh, generous to themselves and the traumas they may have experienced, thoughtful about who they're working with and the world that they would like to be part of creating, which is not about technology, but it's about the sort of reshaping of our imagination so that we could use this, these amazing powers for not um, imaginary good, but real good. So this mm. is where future casting is generated not only out of the technology, but out of the, the development of a generous, sensuous, caring, gracious society. Um, and right. I think the whole process has to be coordinated. Yeah. But then the question is really, how do we make sure that our, let's say, subconscious biases and perceptions mm -hmm. that are based on memories or pains from our past or mm -hmm. even trauma, that we don't project them out into the world exponentially faster, exponentially wider? <laughs> in the age of AI, because that's really, to me, what these Terminator scenarios are like. Like we all have mm -hmm. a history and this history clouds our imagination with dark spots. Um, and therefore I always say this, this, this time is an opportunity for us to clear the mirror, um, wait, basically not the mirror, to clear ourselves so that the mirror oh, that AI is and the worlds that we build are is clear because if you have mm -hmm. chocolate on your face <laughs> and you look in the mirror uh, you <laughs> and you look in the mirror will you and you see it will you be able to you know get it off by um erasing mm -hmm. it from the mirror or do you mm -hmm. have to actually erase it from yourself and that's so vital in this day and age because so many mm -hmm. futures and projections right. that we see are based on past data and science there's nothing wrong with science but we have to remember that um yeah the, if we we don't want to replicate the past in the future we want something right. new to emerge and that can only happen if science and let's say a more spiritual perspective it, you don't even have to call it spiritual, but let's say a conscious perspective of what do I want to create? What really comes from within are combined or yeah, what how I, can we, yeah. How do you see that? Well, I, well, um, I don't think we can completely erase the kind of narratives that will be born out of 
anger and, and vengeance, um, small mindedness, they will emerge. Um, but currently there's not a system to, to have a dialogue with that and extinguish it. I'll give you an ex a concrete example of what I've been doing in teaching game design. So, I mean, when I was younger, the idea of teaching about subliminal seduction through advertising had to do with hidden pictures and hidden sounds um, in the visual or in the audio space. Today, that needs to be rethought because the most powerful tool of subliminal seduction is the building of alternate facts, disinformation in the form of alternate realities. Um, whether it's cults or whether it's political parties that use a narrow vision of facts to distort and make it seem like reality. Um, this game design, this alternate reality game design has become pervasive. And it is most usually, in, when people are aware of it publicly, it's usually pretty negative. Um, whether it's things like the Make America Great Again or uh, Q or any number of projects which would be in the realm of science fiction, typical when leashed, unleashed into the world became become like a monster that gets released from like Godzilla actually walking through the streets of you know London. Um, so what I do is not, I mean, I can rail against it, I can talk about it, I can point out I have a really good friend who works in game design named Reed Berkowitz. He's an amazing lecture on how alternate reality games are constructed. Um, what I do is I teach students to create an alternate reality game with no boundaries. Like I don't say, the only thing I say is you have to use some real facts plus your imagination to create an experience. And they may come up with something that we all find repulsive they might come up with something that's fantastical um usually there's a balance of both actually most of the ones that they create are ones that are more hopeful because they also like aside think that people actually are more caring and loving than we have in the popular imagination um once they've done an alternate reality game using real history have unleashed it on a group of their fellow students across the campus, um, we then discuss the, how these tools are so powerful and how these tools are running inside of and outside of media, government, uh, culture at the moment. I feel like in some ways I've given them a shot. I've given them a way to navigate a filter, a, a pair of glasses to see what is being said and to try to distinguish between information and disinformation because they've created an alternate reality game they're actually more you know they're almost like fellow artisans going oh i see how they did that that's interesting but they connected that up they need to know transmedia they need to know how stories are not told in one medium at a time but across mediums over time with mm -hmm. different types of uh, connections between people both in media and live, in, in things that are filmed and things that are found in objects and gatherings, all the ways in which people connect. Transmedia is a key piece to alternate reality games. In fact, you can't actually teach alternate reality games without also teaching transmedia, which is why I packed the two together. It's part game and it's part storytelling. But once they have those tools, I, I guess this is the ever optimist part of my uh, personality and uh love is that i do trust that people given the opportunity will be more cautious uh, and more caring and leave space for others and that so far in anecdotal evidence always seems to be true and at the end of it they're much more careful at spreading the you know what i've heard or you know what people are saying dot 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 because that is the prime tool of the ultimate reality um, storyteller. Right. Yes. Yeah, so interesting. So interesting. Mm -hmm. 
that you also see that that actually changes them. I was actually yeah. talking with, about something similar this morning with, with my partner that, mm -hmm. you know, in this day and age with deep fakes and all, all that, um, it's kind of like also not only developing a new conceptual framework of, you know, how reality is being manipulated and how this works, mm -hmm. but also a new sense, like a new, um, let's say, BS radar that makes yeah. us mm -hmm. feel whether something is real or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I, it must be possible to even evolve um, beyond just mere technicalities. Uh, maybe there will be, you know, inscriptions in metadata or videos that makes you be able to look up if something is, you know, real or, or tinkered with. But even beyond that, you know, I can already tell when there's chat GPT involved when I read a text. Um, mm -hmm. Many people probably will not, but, you know, we can train that muscle until we find that we really are more attracted to something that you cannot tell it, that, that there is human interaction interwoven in the text, that there is that there is yeah. a perception behind the words that you read that doesn't come from the machine, but from lived experience, embodied experience. And, mm -hmm. and that that will be what we will be looking for, the real thing. But with media, mm -hmm. the coming years will be probably weird because people will start to play with this. It's the wild, wild west. The US elections are coming. Sora is released as the beast. <laughs> Even before that, it's it's pretty insane mm -hmm. that, that we will now be able to see manipulated media in, in something so important politically, geopolitically as the US elections. Doesn't that ever also worry you? And how do you go about, I mean, except from teaching your students different ways to analyze reality, but what are your personal thoughts about that? Um, I mean, how does one, you know, really make yourself safe and prepare others in a tsunami? Right? It's, <laughs> it, is, it is, like you said, it is um, cascading. And it's like disinformation um, of all kinds. It usually blocks the sun. I mean, it blocks the ability to see things that are true. So, I mean, you said um, like a BS radar, um, but I would, I would actually put it in the positive. It, we have to develop an aesthetic. We have to develop an aesthetic for life and uh, a hunger for inclusion. Um, you know, when I was younger, I would watch things on films and television. I never noticed how everyone was white male. Never noticed it. You know, I became inured to the kind of uh, sarcasm and ridicule that people who were different, you know, uh, women did not exist unless they were very much older or very young. Um, and like the whole question of who is representing reality. I still remember seeing, you know, black children holding white dolls, right? Like Santa was always white, Jesus was always blonde. I mean, the unreality was so pervasive, it didn't seem tangible. And it's changed, right? It's changed in a very short time. You know, where like the impossibility of something like gay marriage. There's now, you know, people, I mean, I'm not sure what the latest anniversary is for gay couples is now, but I think we're probably approaching, you know, uh, 10 year anniversaries or more, right? It's like, it's becoming, um, like the, I always say, like there is such a thing as time travel. It's relatively slow, <laughs> but one day at a time. But, you know, I remember seeing this production at the Gate Theater um, about a beautiful gay play. Um, can you remember the name of it? Um, and the audience was cheering and crying. And I remembered Dublin 20 years earlier. And I just thought, how is this Dublin? How is this this Christian, you know, like, and it's the same city. It's the same theater, you know, it's just, and I said, how I'm here? Like, I just feel like, how did I end up in this future? So generally i find 
the future having to be involved more positively. Of course, I'm always looking to pick the rubies from the mud, but in fact, I think that there's so much to be uh, um, encouraged by. And I think that it's not written that we are doomed. Um, the, 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 the fearful imaginations of our storytellers and of our media and of our politicians um, does not predict the future. They are actually just putting a finger on the scale, hoping we don't notice and tipping the balance. So we just have to put a whole fist on the other side and flip it one person at a time, one group at a time, one audience at a time, one user base at a time. Um, whether it's in, this is where entertainment and teaching and persuasion of all kinds needs to be uh, coordinated with the goal of making a positive outcome. I mean, mm -hmm. climate is a perfect example because um, I was, um, I think that we've talked about this, um, so I've been working for the last three years in Iraq on a project of initially brought to me as create games to get young people more activated in climate change and youth involvement. That was the sort of what I was asked. But it was so much more than that um, because we ultimately learned that the games were needing to become more social. So we moved from creating a sort of alternate reality games, which is what they initially asked me to do, to urban adventure games, to building of festivals, to building of a, um, a hackathon contest where people would propose different ideas for their communities. And then we then even added a Web3 dimension where they created an online uh, series of spaces building communities in Discord. Um, the generation of enthusiasm did not come easily because as i remember one storyteller from the anbar province said to me you know everything we're doing it's really not going to change anything and i said hold that thought and let me ask you another question which is who are we if we don't actually bond together and begin to be the change like who are we then and suddenly it was like and then it was like we were back. So the negative is there, but it doesn't have to be what we, you know, focus on what we feed. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, as a result, so if we had paused with that very, you know, you know, honest assessment, especially in Iraq, uh, we would have paused. But in fact, what's happened? Yeah, still might not change everything, but the generation of community and love and uh, sharing and you know, generations of 30 and 30 year olds beginning to sort of like get invested in their young democracy between Kurd and Arab. I do, I am very optimistic, um, but it's not without inspiration. They've given that to me. Like mm. I was already optimistic, but now I'm fully, so I went to, to go, go teach, but they taught me and gave me so much more because they're they're pushed to a wall those young people in iran and yet they're laughing they're singing they're sharing they're they're building something which i hope gets the chance to become reality um so yeah it's we push against it and we don't need to uh, focus on what they're doing we need to focus on what we're doing and not only in response to it but because this is what we should be doing this is what this generation, us, we have this moment, we have life now, we should be doing this. For mm -hmm. what, for how, what does it turn out to be? These are not the questions that humans have ever asked. Humans have always had a kind of cathedral thinking of like building for the, the structures that they would never get to live to see. And we have to do that in now our way, using this technology and using the collective creative imagination for good. Yes, yes. And I like what you say about the younger generations, because by giving them tools to, um, I mean, if, if you inherit, and I have felt the same, if you inherit a world that if you watch the news, mm -hmm. you can get very depressed by and I mean, if I was at this weekend, I was at my nieces and 
looking at the shows they watch on TV, even before they even enter high school, you start to think, wow, I inherit a deserted, well, hazardous <laughs> minefield of problems that my parents and their parents and their parents have created. Right. So it's like, okay, you have a choice. Either you focus on that and you start to rebel against what already happened, or you mm -hmm. get the tools to start working first on you know creating alignment with what you feel is your role what is your agency what you can do taking actions on your own behalf uh using your individual mm -hmm. talents being that be in the hive with which everyone has a specific role and then act on your highest curiosity your highest excitement with no any no attachment to the outcome but just because it feels good because it feels good and, we and begin it is to, good <laughs> and it is good but it's fun it's not because we have to or because the mm -hmm. world otherwise will enter doomsday it's because that's how life wants to create the new and we've been so wired me included to um, to conceptualize everything and to mm -hmm. to to um, act based on knowledge or mm -hmm. you know even if you read something or hear something in, in the news you can get inspired mm -hmm. but you always have to connect it back to something that that fits your role that you feel excited about and I think um, eventually even if we we think we act and build these new worlds because we have to change the world and have to change others. That's another misconception because that's not how life works. A tree blossoms and flourishes because it lets life flow through it. It doesn't mm. think it has to give apples to humans because otherwise they get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's just about opening up to life and let life express itself and then use these new emerging technologies that are much more fluid, much more, in many ways, natural because they allow mm -hmm. you to paint a multidimensional picture that everyone can reach um, mm. to, 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 to build the future you want to see by being the future you want to see. Yeah. Right. And and uh, there i meet so many people who are stuck at complaining about how bad everything is and that's right. such a waste and that's such yeah. a waste and luckily the and, you younger know, generation can't afford to do that well you know there's something also emerging in the younger generation too they have the tools to create their own stories right they can actually create their own features their own characters like i've never in any class had them study an existing ip we've never studied marvel we've never looked at harry potter we've never looked at giraffe none of those but yet we've built you know transmedia worlds created worlds um out of original ip and original creativity and they get to tell their own stories so when it's happening they actually are experiencing themselves and their shared uh, imagination at a scale where like who needs to, who needs a, a a mega corporation to sort of feed and fuel them so the the technology and i will say the technology has enabled them to see much more quickly their ideas visualized their ideas turned into sound and landscape and location-based storytelling they've been quickly able to sort of iterate i mean i have given them the opportunities to adapt um, some classic short stories, uh, Dor using Hans Christian Andersen stories because of it gets them deeper into storytelling. But many times I have a process of using um, uh, a tool that I learned years ago in studying visual art, which is to really look at the painting and look at how it's using line and color, shape, speculate about the intention of the author, the artist, but don't have an, any idea that it's a message. Look at it as a kind of a world. And now I have them project an idea of a creature that lives in that world. And it's not visible from the surface. And as they do that, they begin to 
and I, I have a series of questions and you know about the creature for them to think about they write a, a notes on what that creature is in writing and you know as they you know uh, speculate about the creature then i invite them into mid journey and they begin to visualize the 2d version of this creature so now they actually can see this creature which you know in some ways is not actually certainly it's not actually in the painting right but it is in their imagination projected into the speculation of the creature which means that the creature is actually some part of their identity psychological emotional creative um they may not recognize this creature as what Jung would have called the shadow self, but this creature is dear to them in some way because, you know, unlike Frankenstein made from cadavers, this is actually born from within them, right? And so then they have to bring this creature in, into an a, AI infused like three dimensionality. Um, we've used CSM for that. Uh, we took that into blockade AI and created a world so now they have a world they have a three-dimensional creature all of which is the painting has inspired but the painting is now somewhere in the background as the sort of way in and it's all themselves using the ai and then i bring them into groups now we have five people and these creatures and they have to create a shared world and think about the geographical as well as the historical what are the histories of these cultures what is the history of this planet or this geological or sometimes cosmic space that they co-inhabit so they have to think about themselves in relationship to each other activate it step by step brilliant brilliantly quickly through the speed of their imagination and the speed of the ai so in the course of a few hours they now are being able to inhabit these worlds inside of a virtual reality headset and begin to find the voice of these creatures, sometimes using AI to find the voice and the dialogues, the crossovers. And once they've done that, they are now in so many more ways, deeply connected to each other. And that which is negative is actually balanced with that which is positive. And they actually see the ecosystem of, ecosystem of humans within both visual and three dimensions because we're in this moment we're in right now. Mm. Can you name a few tools and AI applications that you use in that process for people to be able to play yeah. with? So um, I've been using Claude and ChatGPT to generate the mind of the character. Of course, Claude? They need Claude? Claude, Claude like a, the, the French name, Claude. Oh, Claude, like, yeah, yeah. Like, like WC. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Claude and ChatGPT, but you know, they can't just go straight in, just like when it learns about prompts to create a, um, the, the juice of a playwright or screenwriter, I need to actually introduce them to the playwriting tools that I know from my years of theater. And they begin to sort of generate those and then generate them with the AI. So a person who perhaps have never written a script before but actually begins to create a voice in a monologue or in a dialogue with another creature within their world. Um, um, the, I've used Mid Journey and Mustavar for the 2D dimensionality, the visualization. Um, um, I've used uh, CSM, which is a, it's just recently had an interesting upgrade. So now you can create a three dimensional version of your two-dimensional creature so now the creature can live in the you know be pulled into the blockade ai which is another ai platform which also just had a, a major upgrade where now you can actually have these creatures using unreal engine begin to bring them into the 3d world that was inspired by their prompts and their their mental imagination um, and now they're inside of this world. Uh, they can do a LARP. They can do role play inside of role playing through their shadow selves. So 
because it's not just some character that comes from, you know, Saturday morning television, but it's actually a character who has roots in them. They actually know the voice of this character. They have an intuition about who they are. And the creature doesn't look like them because it was born from within them, not based on appearances. So I think this is a tremendous tool for um, getting past the kind of bullying and predisposition people have based on appearances, um, based on being an ableist society. So these creatures can do anything. Um, so when you begin this type of ethos into VR and into interactions in the virtual spaces, it will bleed into the real world. Like this, we don't do anything in a parallel world that doesn't have an impact on the real world. So you blend your own uh, imaginations into this virtual and the virtual then bleeds into the real world, potentially creating a circuit between shared uh, personal humanity, shared humanity, and the possibilities of doing things in the real world much more um, intentionally rather than reactively. Mm. Fabulous. I, I'm sure that I will repeat this process and look up these tools <laughs> and other people will too. Yeah. Mm. Um, what I also find so interesting in this time and day that I mm. hear in your experience and vision philosophy as well mm. um, is that we depart from the narrative arc of the hero's journey. And I Absolutely. wanted to have you talk about this a little bit because, you know, I believe mm -hmm. that in, you know, building positive stories with mm -hmm. AI, we first have to start seeing AI as not something outside of us, but created by us, but also our environment as an ecosystem that intertwines mm -hmm. and collaborates, that we are never alone, that we always, whether or not we know it, partner with the world around us and mm -hmm. that should be reflected into what we determine as heroism because mm -hmm. if we continue on the path of individualism into ai we will soon you know experience more alienation mm -hmm. more anxiety and all that kind of disconnect yeah. from our body dissociation from our feelings etc so we have mm -hmm. to create a new narrative arc and I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that well i think the problems of the hero's journey are reflected in this concept of only i can fix this right um the idea that upon you rests the saving of the kingdom if it's fantasy upon you rests the restoration of america says the politician like upon like this notion that one person can do this is i think the preface for it or the preamble for this is the the myth of author like the fact that we have the idea that there is an author well um every year people win best you know director they created the film because they're the director um we celebrate authorship in all kinds of ways which is not to say individuality and personal choice isn't key but no one authors anything everything is adaptive whether it's from something you read, something you saw, something that inspired you, a teacher whose name you forgot. Like we are always in teams in our mind's imagination, right? But then we begin to sort of like the ego presses and the culture presses for this idea of the author. And then because of that myth-making of the author, we begin to generate stories about how to become that creator. So in my idea of philosophy is that we should begin to sort of look at the personal as being part of a collective. It doesn't have to be a large, massive collective. It can just be a group of people. And in that group of people, then you have, if it's designed well, and I think a lot of times people like have an allergy to group work because usually it's not well designed, but well-designed group process, developing co-creative, work means that you don't make the mistake of ending up with you know stories that are all about and written by and all about white men you just wouldn't have that because it wouldn't be part of 
how the kitchen worked, of making the work. Like there'd be other processes. You also wouldn't have stories that depended on one person to transcend all of the evils of the world and show an example, a beacon to the world they return to in the hero's journey. You might have a group of people, right? You might have people who were come from in different ways. So we are seeing the reemergence of that type of storytelling in the strangest of places, even in things like comic books, where it, the solo film is now replaced by the group or the team. Um, we still haven't evolved that sufficiently in film or in television or in fiction. It is coming and it actually is critical because if we can do that, we might actually be able to um, generate stories that have many different shapes. Um, I have a series of workshops and lectures on the shape of narrative. And so the, um, the hero's journey is but one of what I've identified as five different shapes. The, tri the triangle is the shape of the hero's journey. It's the, what we learned in school, the rising action, you know, crisis, falling action, denouement, falling action, right? But in fact, there are uh, stories that are spiral stories that work in the system of a labyrinth where you pass yourself where you've been and see yourself on a journey. It does not have an, a conclusion like a transformation, but might be a transformation like um, uh, wisdom or uh, the quest to continue. Uh, we see stories like the square stories, which are cubular, which are like the multiple stories, like a, uh, like a, um, a series of cubes upon cubes upon cubes, where every piece holds the entire story, but no one piece is complete without the others. Um, and uh, of course, the circular story, where we come back to where we left, but know it in a different way. Um, and the, the, the cross as a shape, where you're building stories through relationships. The branch narrative is a good expression of that. And it's actually one of the reasons I think the hunger to leave the hero's journey is one of the things that's evident in the shift of young people into video games. Because in the multiplayer online games, it's not about you, it's about us, right? Um, and I think the continue, you know, energy that sports has on the imagination is similarly to teams. So if we were to activate this in the creative realm, where we'd have people actually develop and create their own stories and develop teams of writers or teams of uh, animators or uh, filmmakers, I think we would begin to see um, naturally emerge a kind of positivity and protopic thinking because um, no group likes a sourpuss, right? So like if there's a sourpuss in the group who's like a naysayer and they'll be balanced. And it, once you have even four or five people, it's hard to maintain a negative energy in a group. It's only in the sort of like dormant mental journey about heroes and personal vengeance that you get that kind of sourness. I think generally humans have a sweetness to them, to their imagination. They have a glint in their eye. They have smiles much more than they have frowns. It's hard to hold a frown long, but you can smile for a whole life. So I feel like, you know, we have to think about all of our new tools and all of the emergence of our new ways of communicating by looking at who we are and how we are best. And we are best working, you know, like making a dinner as a group of people rather than one person, you know, knocking themselves out like Cinderella in the kitchen. Like we have to be, um, be what we are when we're best, not when we're worst. Mm. So. Yeah, and I mean, I have had my personal struggles with that because eventually what I learned is you can only effectively collaborate if you really know yourself. If you can be a strong individual, if you yeah. know your skills, your talents, your point of view. And mm. therefore, I've also said to myself for a couple of years, I shouldn't be collaborating uh, because I'm still finding my own voice. I'm still finding my own role. And if I collaborate now, I blur the lines too much and I give away too much 
um, eventually losing myself in, in a group. And I've had that experience a few times. So I think that, again, is also about balance, right? It's not becoming mm -hmm. a hive and losing uh, our individuality. It's really about blending both. It's about individual, yeah. it's about alone together, together alone, <laughs> interwoven, and, yeah. and that will create a strong story with individual talents contributing yeah. to the transformation in their yeah. own unique ways. Yeah. And yeah. then also it's really about changing the culture of achievement because, you know, as an artist, right. I've been invited to exhibit or to, mm -hmm. uh, to have my name in an article. And I have had, you know, conflicts within teams of kind of trying to battle, uh, they want me and they accept they kind of exceptionalize the the leader or the founder or the artist right, right. but they don't offer a place for the group because mm -hmm. we are so focused on on this right this is who is done blah, 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 blah. so that also creates the invitation to have a cultural shift and really um crediting everyone and i'm still right. figuring that out and i think everybody's yeah. still figuring that out but it's definitely yeah. needed yeah that's i think greta sunberg really spoke to it really well when she critiqued the media for focusing only on her rather than all of these people with right them. yeah it's a battle yeah for sure yeah. um another question um is really because i work increasingly in business and mm -hmm. with leaders and mm -hmm. in business you know you have very realistic uh, statistical mm -hmm. ways of looking at the future predicting mm -hmm. based on data well how can we use these tools i know you have some experience with working uh, with business to mm -hmm. use world building as a tool to progress narrative mm -hmm. cultures eventually products and technologies within a business environment? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the first, I think, challenge for uh, someone who wants to build a, a creative narrative within a corporation or a business is that the hegemony within the, within the business is built on um, production or has a reporting structure which is very much a pyramid of some kind. Um, and, you know, ideas coming from everywhere means that there's also, uh, there's, a, there's a climbing structure that one has to address or transcend in some way. Um, the project I worked on was, um, that speaks to this, is a project that I did in Poland for the, a corporate group who was interested already in future casting, was interested in where, um, it's a company that uses a lot of uh, autonomous equipment in a series of convenience stores and uh, supermarkets where they've actually begun to automate a lot. So they're already a future thinking company, but they began to feel like they were potentially needing to increase everyone in the company's attention to what's around the corner, what's next. Could we imagine um, what we can't imagine, right? And how would we do that? So they brought together a group of experienced designers and I was one of them. And um, they were asking, where does the, where, where can we imagine the company in a hundred years, 50 years, a hundred years? Um, and so, I looked at them as before we can begin this journey from today, we have to begin from some uh, you, meaning them, um, in, a, in a more essential self. We had to lose the hegemony. We had to lose the differences between how the men and the women were in the company, how the younger and the older, the people who were higher in the pyramid within the company. We had to somehow level it. Um, so one of the things I did was I took them into a very creative exercise um, uh, where they had to interview each other and create a character based on the interview. 
um, that was their mythic self, like a mythic character. It couldn't be the name of the person, but they had to include attributes of that person. And the each of the people being created as a character got to choose a character image from a, from a deck that I use. It's actually a Dutch company has amazing uh, tarot images. So I let them pick from the tarot uh, deck and pick the image that represented them. And I matched it in a little lanyard sleeve where they now had the image and now they had their mythic self. And they began to wear these identities like a persona or as they would say in LARP, an alibi. They didn't have to be themselves. They were now this character. So this character, which is essentially them, but not visually, physically, um, uh, hierarchically their power, they were all mythic creatures of, of different kinds with different names, some fantastical, some kind of creative, some sci-fi, and they got to enjoy each other as people through this process. So that was that, that was that was the first step. So then um, I took the group and um, and uh, I had them explore their ideas about the future. Now I'm not using the mythic selves, just like their ideas as people. What's the future going to be like in a hundred years? And we just threw a bunch of post-it notes up and began to sort of like see what they were thinking. And most of it was pretty negative, right? Because they, like all of us have absorbed fear to their kind of like primal brains about what dangers are coming. Humans are, are predisposed to think about dangers more than opportunities. And there it was in their ideas of the future. Um, so they, we took a break and we came back and I said, all right, new question. We had a new board up. Um, name your favorite film or genre of film. And they're like, where is this going? <laughs> right? So. They did that, and we ended up with the 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 winner was pirate movies, and ultimately, Pirates of the Caribbean was their favorite of the pirate movies in Poland. So then I said, "All right, now let's take what we just learned about our our visions of the future, and let's adapt Pirates of the Caribbean as a new movie set a hundred years in the future. So it's a sci-fi pirates film." which given the population i was thought oh, it was a risk to invite this but boy they were right at it and suddenly the ocean wasn't the ocean but it was data he was a cyber hacker uh, jack sparrow was a cyber hacker um all of the different elements and characters that what the british was was like the eu trying to catch him like all these things adapted so it really wasn't pirates of the caribbean anymore but it was really this cyber pirates of the of, of of the hacker world and they sort of sketched it out they created characters little elements all of that good another break and then we came back and said all right we need an opening night party design for our sci-fi film and coming from the world of food and the world of hospitality they were like right on it and so they created this big gorgeous opening party the food was very cleverly designed the decor how people needed to be dressed. You know, they, they, they did themselves proud in iterating this. And I said, all right, well, you, this is the hardest thing you'll have done. So now let me ask you, if there's a spin-off from this movie that's a Zapka store, this is the company that I worked with in Poland, if there's a store, what would that store be? What would it sell? How would people enter? And they started to imagine this cyber pirate film opening night party adapted into a store what did it sell how did people treat it what was the experience of it the party was so experiential used it so much experience design right and many different types of media the store had to as well they'd already kind of predicted it and then they had to create a quick prototype of that to present to the rest of the company and some of their ideas, however fanciful, were possible, maybe, if they were thought about how they might get there. Now, the mythic character piece didn't play a role in the rest of the workshop, but it framed, the, it created them in a mindset that was playful, that was social, 
and that was like, what? What the hell? Let's go for it. Let's play, you know? And I invited, without saying specifically, you know how to do this. You were children once. But that was underlying, that was the underlying message they got from me. And so ridiculously difficult that, of course, whatever they could try would be useful. So using um, the challenge, the quest, the possibility, um, being outside of the comfort zone, all played a tool, all were tools in developing a kind of a process that changed their relationships to each other. So when they went back to their pyramid in the recap and reflection, so many people pointed out how some of the most silent people in the group previously were suddenly more vocal. Mm. And so it became really clear that they had assets of imagination and thinking that are not being allowed to be heard in the company in every day, in the everyday existence of how they practice. So how do they fix that so they can enable this kind of future thinking? Great. And at the end of the workshop, did they, I mean, that's always the question, did they actually do something with that? Or was the goal to change perception and create a ripple effect that is not necess necessarily measurable or yeah. quantifiable? I think I think generally that's kind of how I always measure success because I've learned over the years that whoever I'm doing a workshop for, whoever I'm teaching, I'm actually teaching their future selves. And their future selves haven't arrived yet to make use of that wisdom. Mm. Um, so later, I mean, I have a collection of amazing notes and letters from people who were students who are using these tools in very different ways. Um, but I think I can be, I'm really assured that they will understand, like because they've experienced it, how working as a group will amplify not only what they want to say, but who they are and how they feel about work. Like that's another big problem is how do people feel about work? Mm -hmm. Because curiosity is usually not invited into the process of people's daily work lives. So to develop curiosity through, you know, getting their attention and developing engagement and building curiosity and next level curiosity to co-creation, to um, uh, developing a sort of transformation and ultimately transcendence of the now to the next. But at first, ha people first have to sort of reconnect uh, with what it is to uh, be playful because we mm. did know these things when we were kids not all of our childhoods aligned with this but in fact the conception of childhood as play because i think sadly the big problem today is that children are more on their devices than they are interacting with each other um, and interacting via text is potentially starving a next generation of the ability to interact so it will be more important later yes yes wow um i had a thought what was the thought mm -hmm. uh, never mind <laughs> never mind <laughs> i might arrive at it no but that's so interesting right to um oh this was the thought um that the future of work in the context of ai i mean that's this is what uh a lot of my you know work and also keynote speaking at workshops is now centered mm -hmm. around and helping people imagine the future of their work the future of their job because you know ai is, is sad to take um uh to take a huge percentage of the tasks that we currently do and do it better and more detailed etc so it mm -hmm. becomes again a huge invitation for us to reimagine what work is because we have become so procedural and mechanical and repetitive in our in our tasks and some mm -hmm. of the things we do every day might not give us the joy but because we have never learned to be playful or learn to follow our curiosity as a measure of success we have not ever asked the question why am i doing this every day so it is an opportunity it's also a risk because you know historically we've seen that the capacity of countries to 
develop new jobs immediately after huge mm -hmm. layoffs are the cause of the new technological innovation coming online mm -hmm. uh, is pretty slow. So we might have some kind of gap between, you know, not being able to execute the jobs in the ways that we have been to and to doing something new that actually may be more exciting to us and better fitting with us and better contributing right. to the whole. So this skill gap is um, is something I really focus on in my work and retraining perceptions. And I think world building and, you know, questioning the reality that we have and, and projecting that into the future we want and doing that collectively is such an important skill to nurture in this day mm -hmm. and age especially in the age of AI. And David, you're a pure magi magician, you're an alchemist. And I'm so excited about hearing all this. Um, maybe we'll do another episode uh, mm -hmm. one day because I, I, I feel I never finished talking with you. Um, <laughs> but is there anything, is there anything um, you still you know, feel is kind of left over and wanting to be said? Mm um yeah um i think we should have courage and take hope and even when we're you know having to sort of develop the knowledge of who we are um it might not be necessary to develop that with a peer group of people who understand it might be just spending time with a population of people who have needs of some kind, whether it's children or elderly or some group, just to be in the space where people are uh, contributing, volunteering, because I feel like the ideas that we have inside of our, you know, or in our cranium uh, need to have a humility, which will make us laugh, which will also make us reinvest in the context. So um, I think there's nothing that can't be fixed in the human with that, you know, that doesn't require other people of some kind. And unfortunately, too many of us are getting our information about others and people from being online and being, you know, uh, confronted with how the narratives are shaped by storytellers who are not necessarily as awakened as we might be. So we might have a process of awakening ourselves and then we sort of like find that almost insulted by the way others frame their stories. I mean, you know, there's something about I'm living in Europe now over a year and I've been traveling both professionally and, you know, creatively in the Middle East and in Asia. And I just find that there's nothing that I get uh, from the news covering Iraq, say, or China, right? In Europe, these are, um, there's, a, there's an imaginary Europe, an imaginary Iraq, an imaginary China that takes place in the media. It's not the real, it's, a, it's, a, it's not even a shadow, it's just a sort of um, uh, through a glass darkly of these, of these real places with real people. And you'd never know. And so if we're living in a world of illusions, it's so good to get outside and actually have a conversation or just observe something that uh, you have to be there to see it um, and that's not always possible but it, it's it's part of what humans have always been best is generously move outside of the circle of their experience to learn about others i mean that's the real meaning of parallel worldism like being in another country or listening to a person's problems or challenges or opportunities they just could not imagine right and now you can imagine it. So now it's actually part of your collective imagination within your solo experience. Right. So, yeah. And the natural world as well, right? Because and the natural world, thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we're not alone on this planet, right? And life is abundant. It's in, it's in, it's, we're endangered. We've endangered ourselves. But life, is more resilient than I think human beings um, will be unless we begin to change our intention of how we live among and amidst, not just each other, but animals, plant life, oceans. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, well, on that note, I feel very complete. And I want to thank you okay. so, so much for yeah. having this conversation. And uh, we'll be writing an article together, um, uh, sourcing from this interview, and maybe mm -hmm. posting this interview as well. I, I really feel that this will benefit a lot of people. So I'm happy, um, happy that we did that. Yeah, well, Sam, I've been reading and watching your talks for a, a long time now. It is just a pleasure to spend time with you and get to be in this shared space, albeit over, over uh, across computers. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to meet one day. I, I, wouldn't yeah. mind, I wouldn't mind coming to New York. Okay, for sure. <laughs> I haven't got, I don't get back there until September, so, but then. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.